span from 1962 through 1969, two formidable teams met one another six times in the National Basketball Association Championship Series. Those two teams were the Boston Celtics and the Los Angeles Lakers. And that rivalry is indeed one of the greatest sports rivalries ever. HBO Sports presents Greatest Sports Rivalries, the Boston Celtics versus the Los Angeles Lakers. Hello, everybody. I'm Barry Tompkins. The show is Greatest Sports Rivalries. Basketball, the subject of the night, the Boston Celtics versus the Los Angeles Lakers. And who better to share some thoughts on that subject with than Tom Heinsohn. Tom, of course, an integral part of those championship years with the Boston Celtics. And Tom, what is it? What was it that made that rivalry what it was? Well, it was really a fantastic rivalry. And uh, we were well established as the champs in those days, coming into 1962. We'd won four out of five titles, three in a row. And uh, coming into 1962, we started to have the demise of the Celtics a little bit, the falling away of some of the nucleus. Bill Sharman retired. And out of Tinseltown also came uh, an eager band of young players headed by a very fine basketball coach, Fred Schaus, who wanted to prove that they were king of the hill. I don't think there's any question but that the Celtics of that era were a glamour team. They were playing in a glamorous time, and Tom Heinsohn took us up to the Boston Garden to show us just how glamorous it really was. This is where it used to happen, the old locker room next to the boiler room. Yeah, it's small. You were lucky to have two hooks. Sometimes it was only a hook and a nail. A lot of great people got dressed in this place. Bill Sharman right over there. Bill Russell right here. And Luskatov back there. And you had to watch out for him or he'd steal your orange juice. The place was so small that you could only let one newspaper guy in at a time. And when they try and pile in and really created a problem, you'd have to wait till the shower overflowed and they got their shoes wet before they'd leave. Yeah, we all breathed in and out together here. That's how tiny it was. But a lot of champagne was poured over a lot of people's heads here. It was a small room, but a lot of people with big hearts got dressed here. We were afraid of nobody. We felt that we went out there with the big green or the big white, and we didn't care who was out there. They had to put five men, we had five, we were ready for anybody. Led by Bill Russell and Bob Cousy, the 62 Celtics had forced a seventh game in Boston Garden by winning game six in Los Angeles. The Lakers were guided by two extraordinary offensive forces, Elgin Baylor and Jerry West. Boston probably had uh, some of the greatest basketball players ever assembled on one team. They played hard every night with great players and mixing with that a running game and their set offense, they didn't do a lot of spectacular things or re there weren't a lot of exchanges of the basketball. It's very simple but very, very efficient and uh, tr defensively they were tremendous. Stubborn as it was, that celebrated defense could not stop Elgin Baylor. Baylor exploded for 61 points in game five playoff record that still stands. Then he hit 41 here in game seven, a feat that had adverse effects on Red Auerbach. The decisive seventh game was as tight as the entire series, and they entered the fourth quarter tied at 75 all. Down the stretch, Boston clung to a slight margin, but boosted by Jerry West's deft shooting touch, the Lakers hung tough. In the closing minute, Jerry West picked off a koozie pass. He'd won game three with a last second steal. Now this play, and Frank Selby's follow-up shot tied the score. With only seconds remaining, Selby had a chance to win it all, but it was not to be, and game seven went into overtime. Elgin Baylor will never forget it. I remember very well the last shot Frank Selby took from the corners, and uh, I really honestly believe he got fouled on the shot. Uh, I know I went up for the offensive rebound, and uh, now and then I look at the film. I have the film of the game, and uh, Sam Jones just practically pushed me right into the official, and no call was made. We went into an overtime, and I know I fouled out, and they won. 
it was, you know, it was a heartbreak situation at the time because I felt that uh, that was one year we could have beaten the Celtics. Sam Jones was just too good too often in overtime, and the Lakers watched helplessly as Bob Cousy ran out the clock and their title dreams disappeared. Round 2, 1963, the Celtics epitomized team balance. Sam Jones leads seven men in double figures, none averaging 20 points a game. One of them is rookie John Havlicek. My first team uh, with the Boston Celtics was probably the best team that I played on in my 16-year career here. And I felt that way because uh, we had so many people who had been winners all their life. I think the main key to the Celtics' success was the fact that we had great depth and we had versatility in our lineup. We had people who could play different positions, particularly in Frank Ramsey and myself. Rookie Havlicek played understudy to Frank Ramsey's famous Celtic sixth man role as he helped them do a 3-1 lead over the Lakers. John Havlicek's first championship would be the last for the Celtics quarterback, Bob Cousy. They called him the Houdini of the hardwood. And in his time, he was a sensation unique in basketball history. wizardry always drew crowds wherever the Celtics played. But when Bill Russell arrived, they began their string of championships and made Red Auerbach's job a coach's delight. There was nobody that ever lived that played the game for the fast break like Cousy and Russell. Game six of the 63 championship was Cousy's last, and it almost ended tragically. There was absolutely no one around him. He wasn't involved in a play or anything. We had just scored, and he was just trotting backwards on defense and fell down. He came out of the game, and our lead started to dwindle. From 10 points, I think it got down to four, and somehow he got the courage within himself to come back and play because he figured that might be the last game he would ever play for the Celtics. I think he knew his injury was severe enough that had it gone to seven games, he wouldn't have played. He got back into the lineup and immediately picked up the tempo and preserved the victory for us. And it's one of the things that I'll remember his last game, which was uh, during the first year of my uh, being with the Celtics. And it was a great start for me and a great ending for him. It was the end of an era for the Boston Celtics and many wondered if they'd ever be the same without their captain. So Bob Cousy was gone, but Tom, somehow, the Celtics managed to replace the irreplaceable. Well, Cousy was Mr. Offense, but there was still Mr. Defense, Bill Russell. And when Cousy left, I think all the rest of the Celtics took it as a personal challenge to win it without the Coos. Uh, along came Casey Jones. He was inserted into the starting lineup. And he, in his own right, was a great defensive ball player. But Russell, with his fantastic intensity, was determined now to become the greatest name in the game. And I think he did it. In 1964, the Celtics wound up in the championship final once again. But this time, it wasn't the Lakers who provided the competition. It was the Warriors. What that did mean, though, was a classic confrontation against maybe the two best big men to ever play. What Bill Russell did for defense, I think Wilt Chamberlain did for putting a ball in the hole. Averaged over 50 points a game one year. Yeah, but invariably, Russell won the MVP. It is commonly accepted that both Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain were awesome basketball players, intimidators and dominators. Their matchup was one of immense proportion, unprecedented in basketball history. Russell, the shrewd defensive genius, versus Chamberlain, the point-scoring giant. Who was the greatest big man in basketball? The argument still rages. Well, the greatest influence in the game today of the modern basketball, without any question at all, has been Bill Russell. Bill Russell uh, not only dominated the game, but he would destroy teams. Russell supporters point to his 11 championship rings. Chamberlain's his unrivaled career scoring average. Elgin Baylor had his point of view. Well, I think they were both, both uh, tremendous players. I think that both of them were the type of player that could really uh, dominate a, a ball game. Uh, I think particularly Wilt. Uh, 
because Wilt could do it on both ends, particularly his later years. Wilt uh, just did it on both ends. He played the defense, he played the offense. His public expected everything of Wilt Chamberlain. Despite league-leading statistics year after year, his teams lost the big ones, often to Russell Celtics. Wilt was not winning championships, and he was branded a loser. But Jerry West disputes that label. I happened to play with Will Chamberlain, and he was a very maligned basketball player. That guy was a tremendous player. I think that if later in his career, if he would have been asked to do some of the things early in the career that he was doing late, that maybe people would have thought of him in the terms of Bill Russell. I mean, I played against both of them. Both of them were magnificent players, and uh, frankly, Will Chamberlain helped prolong my career another couple of years. I just simply could not have played uh, as well or as long without him around. One issue on which everyone could agree was the tremendous value of Bill Russell to the Boston Celtics. We simply had, didn't have a center that could cope with Bill Russell. I mean, it was just absolutely a wipeout in there. Uh, he was a marvelous basketball player, a player that I have as much respect for anyone that, that I'd ever played against. But uh, he was surrounded by a collection of all-stars, and I think very few people realize that not only they had one of the great players ever play at, at a very dominating position, but also an all-star team around him. Tom, Jerry West said all-star team, but I think maybe the key word there is team. The Celtics lent new meaning to that word. We had some great ball players. Frank Ramsey, how's that for a name? A guy who became the prototype for the sixth man role. Uh, Tom Sat Sanders, who had the difficult job of trying to contain Elgin Baylor in all these great championship series. I wouldn't want to be him. Then we had guys uh, like Jungle Jim Luskatov, the man that was supposed to swing on vines, but really didn't. And we had some fellows coming off the bench that used to get caught up in the tradition of the Celtics and made uh, great contributions at key junctures. Fellows like Gene Conley, Gene Guerrilla, Clyde Lavella, Carl Braun, all great names, all great contributors. When you talk about the Lakers, of course, you think Jerry West and you think Elgin Baylor. But their supporting cast wasn't exactly chopped liver. No, I wouldn't say so either. Frank Selvey was a national scoring leader before he joined the pros. They had Jim King, an outstanding guard. They had uh, Jim Krebs, a very fine center. Hot Rod Hunley, the man of many tricks. And they had a guy that I used to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against uh, who was an outstanding rebound, a defensive man. And when Elgin Baylor was in the service for six months, showed his scoring prowess by averaging over 30 points a game. And that man's name was Rudy LaRusso. Well, that brings us to your last season as a member of the Boston Celtics in another routine championship. The 1965 championship was marred by the loss of Elgin Baylor, who severed his kneecap in the semifinals. Baylor would be plagued by injury the rest of his career. I know that later in his career, where he had a lot of injuries and everything, and it was really a shame that when basketball got to be as popular as, as it is today, that people didn't have a chance to see this guy play because um, it was really a treat to see a, a, a person play like him. Plus, everyone who played with him loved him. Uh, we complimented each other very well. I think in many situations that Jerry took a lot of pressure off me, particularly offensive pressure, and I did the same thing for Jerry. Uh, Jerry could always come up with a big play going down the stretch, and many times, uh, we, you know, we would go to Jerry because he did make the big offensive plays when we needed it. In 1965, they needed it more than ever. With Baylor on the injury list, Jerry West ran up an incredible 40.6 playoff average. Even with this outstanding performance, West couldn't do it alone. The Celtics won the third Boston-Los Angeles matchup in five games. For old number 15, Tom Heinsohn, it was a super way to end a career with his seventh straight National Basketball Association championship. 1966, Fred Schaus and his Lakers down 3-1 had battled back to force a seventh game showdown in the Garden. This would be our back's last hurrah as Celtics coach. Red's unrivaled cast of talent, his role in the Celtic success story is often discussed. But one thing was certain, when it came to preparing a team for one single contest, Red Auerbach was the master psychologist. He knows uh, how to uh, get you up for it. He's a very uh, aggressive type guy, and, uh, and he gets his point across, and he knows how to upset you. Uh, and, which means uh, he'll blow you away after, after a bad loss. And when he blows you away, then you're shaking in your pants. I think, you know, the coaching had a great deal to do with it, but I think you still have to have the, the talent in talking to some of the players, you know, Russell, uh, Sam, and 
Heinz and they thought Red was an excellent coach. But uh, I think you still need the horses. That is like putting, I like always say, putting a mule in the Kentucky Derby and put the best jock in the world on it. And I doubt if you'll bring them a paycheck. So you have to have the talent. So they blend in very well. They had the talent, they had the coaching. That talent in the form of Sam Jones and Bill Russell combined for half of the Celtics' 95 points. Despite a late rally spurred by Elgin Baylor's hot hand, the Lakers were thwarted once again. If we had ever had a chance, this would have been our chance because we had been able to win back on their home court. But uh, again, uh, their experience, uh, their ability to play winning basketball on the road, which is a sign of a great team, uh, paid off for them. The ritual, the lighting of Red Auerbach's victory cigar signaled his final championship as the Celtics escaped with a 95-93 victory. The fourth time in five years that Boston had frustrated Los Angeles in the NBA Finals. Red Auerbach and his cigar. I have to ask you, Tom, did any of you guys ever tread on that hallowed ground? Well, I had an exceedingly bad day. Everything seemed to go wrong this particular day, and Red, in true compassion, said, Tommy, why don't you smoke this cigar and calm your nerves on the way home? And I got my car, headed off towards Worcester, got about halfway, stopped at a traffic light, lit up the cigar. Within one puff, it exploded right in my face. The end of a perfect day. And I decided right then I was going to get even with the man. Took me six months of slipping him uh, really good cigars that weren't loaded. And finally, we're in the middle of the playoffs. And he, by now, accepted these cigars with grace. And uh, I slipped him a loaded one right in front of all the newspaper people in the, in the entire country. And he took two puffs and the thing exploded and he chased me out of the building. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Red might have known when to get out. 1967, neither the Celtics nor the Lakers made it to the championship final. 1967, I guess you'd have to say, pretty much of a year of transition. Yeah, a new nucleus was being formed with uh, a new leader. And to that nucleus was added some really fine basketball players. Don Nelson, Bailey Howell, Wade Embry, Larry Siegfried started to come into his own. And they acquired uh, Emmett Bryant, who really did a great job for them. So Bill Russell and his mates took one year off, but it didn't take a whole lot of time for things to right themselves. The Celtics and Lakers were back at it again in 1968. Elgin Baylor and Jerry West continued to supply the punch for Los Angeles, but the Celtics made a significant change. Bill Russell was now the playing coach, and his style contrasted sharply with Red Auerbach's gregarious manner. I think that uh, probably the biggest difference was the fact that uh, Red probably talked a lot more than Bill Russell, and when you got into Bill Russell's doghouse, you more or less stayed there, and Russell had a tendency to just let you work yourself out of it, and he realized that with a veteran team, they all knew what they had done in the past, and there wasn't any reason for them to change because it had been a successful formula. That formula kept right on working in game four at Los Angeles as the Celtics tied the series and returned to Boston for an overtime victory in game five. That offset another great performance by Jerry West. Well, uh, again, with those people, they seem to find a way. And uh, I think the frustrating thing for me was the, the, the closer we got, the better I seemed to play individually and the worse our results were. And uh, I know that uh, at that time, after that ball game, I seriously felt that maybe it was time for me to stop playing basketball because it depressed me so much uh, to lose to these people. I, I, it, it didn't seem fair. The Celtics' six-game clincher was like a recurring nightmare for Elgin Baylor. I just remember the same old story. <laughs> you know, we just play as hard as we could possibly play and always end up the Celtics on top. 1969, however, was going to be different. The Lakers posted their best record ever, and it breezed through the early playoff rounds. The presence of Will Chamberlain and Laker gold boosted confidence, making the West Coasters an overwhelming favorite, one seed an aging Celtics team that had struggled to a fourth place division finish. The Celtics in 69 were an uh, over-the-hill gang, you might say, and not having the best uh, Celtic record of all time. We didn't know how good we were, but once the playoffs started, the whole atmosphere around here changed because we knew that uh, this was the time of year that more or less belonged to the Celtics. For the old men, it was last year for Sam, it was going to be the last year for Russell, and we had uh, some other senior citizens more or less that uh, were going to be hanging it up in a year or two. And maybe we felt that uh, 
after the first two games in Los Angeles that we really could compete with these people because even though we lost two of them, we felt that uh, those were two of the best games we had played all year. The Celtics took game three, but the clock tells the story in game four as the Celtics down by one point have time for just one final shot. Sam came off of this triple pick that we set up and the ball hung on the rim, which seemed like an eternity, and somehow it trickled in, which enabled us to win that game. And that was really the key game of that series. Any time that we were in a situation where we needed a basket, we felt the best possible player to take the shot was Sam Jones, because he had great powers of getting himself open and, and shooting the right shot at the right time. Game six would be Sam's last in Boston Garden, place he'd called home since 1958. His early years were played in Cousy's shadow, but in his 12-year career, he'd been the Celtics' leading scorer five times and had worn 10 championship rings. Graceful, rhythmic, agile, poised, and a great jump shooter. That was Sam Jones. The Celtics not the series at three, but for the first time they face a seventh game showdown without their home court advantage. And Los Angeles has high hopes. They had printed a, a memo sheet before the game and somehow the Celtics got a hold of it. And it said, when Lakers win championship, balloons will drop from ceiling. The USC pep band will come on to the floor and play happy days are here again. And uh, maybe this was a little stimulus for us because uh, they hadn't won anything yet. And we knew by being in championship games what it took to win one because they don't come easy. And they figured that, that by being home, maybe being with the crowd, they finally arrived at the point where they were going to eliminate us. The best of plans was not following the script, however, as the determined Celtics opened a commanding 15-point lead at the end of three quarters. Then, to make matters even worse, Chamberlain comes out with an injury as the fourth quarter begins. I came out in the fourth quarter with a knee problem, having iced up, right. and then when it was iced up, I felt like I could go back in. I asked to go back in the game, and Butch just thought maybe the center who was playing uh, was doing a sufficient job. I think even after the Lakers rallied, Bill Van Bredikoff's decision to keep Wilde on the bench was a very controversial topic. To be so close come back from a deficit uh, to have one of the great players of all time sitting on the bench with an injury uh, when I at the time I thought that uh, he, I know he asked him to go back in the ball game that I later found out and he wasn't in there uh, and none of it made sense to me with the clock running out the Lakers down by just two points once more fate seemed to select the Celtics John Havlicek recalls the play I started to drive to my left, and Keith Erickson came from behind and batted it right to Don Nelson at the free throw line. And Don took the shot, and it went high up off the rim and came straight down through. One final time, the Celtics shatter the Lakers' dream. Six championship series, six Laker losses. That was the only time in my career that we had a better team than Boston Celtics. And we had a better team. I don't think there's any question we were better than they were. Of all the losses, that was the worst I ever had to endure. I mean, that was the one I just simply emotionally couldn't cope with. I think as a player, when you give everything you have and when you're so close, uh, against the same team, and I, I think many times you, when you play the same team all the time, you, you learn these personalities. You almost feel like an arrogance that they have. Um, and they sort of they're sort of laughing at you, and that's the most frustrating thing of all. We always felt that uh, we were better than the Lakers, and I can recall talking to some people early in my career, and we thought it was a mistake when we lost. Tom, I don't think there's any question, but that there was a great mystique about the Boston Celtics. Is there any way that you could explain the magic that was the Celtics? I think it had a lot to do with the color green. You know, there's a saying that there's two kinds of people, those that are Irish and those that wish they were. And uh, we developed truly a national following. And of course, there was the mystery of uh, the Boston Garden itself, the banners flying from the ceiling, the parquet floor, the screaming fans, 
And of course, there was the little leprechaun that we used to have sitting on the rim, swatting away shots at the last second just when we needed it the most. Real or imagine the leprechaun won you a lot of games at the Boston Garden. I have to take you back to 1962, seventh game of that championship series. You guys won it in overtime, and that really kind of set the tone for what was going to be after that. Did you ever stop to think that if the Lakers had won that overtime game, I might be sitting here talking to Rudy LaRusso right now? <laughs> no way. <laughs> Never entered your mind. Never. The Boston Celtics and the Los Angeles Lakers. I know it provided great thrills for you as a player. It provided great thrills for me and millions of others as a spectator. Truly, one of sports' greatest rivalries. Be sure to join us when HBO Sports presents another great sports rivalry. The New York Yankees and the Brooklyn Dodgers. If you leave it now, you'll take away the biggest part of me. Ooh, now, baby, please don't go. And if you leave me now, you'll take away the very heart of me. Ooh, This has been a presentation of HBO Sports.